What drives corporate culture and why should we care? This is the Leaders of Transformation podcast, and on this show, we feature difference makers and world changers who are disrupting for good. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Nicole Jansen, and our guest today is David White. He is a cognitive anthropologist and the co-founder of Ontos Global. He's about to dispel some commonly held myths and show us how to transform culture from the inside out. Are you ready? Post it in the chat. I'm ready if you're watching live and tell us where you're listening from. We have listeners in over 140 countries, so you just never know who's going to show up. During our interview, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions and comments. You can post them in the chat. We'd love to hear from you and we'll address those as we go along. This podcast is brought to you by my coaching and training company. And if you're a leader who wants to do better, be better, or create a better, uh, greater impact in your world around you, go to leadersoftransformation.com forward slash coaching. And you can learn more about the services I provide and book a free consult with me to discuss your goals and specific situation. By the way, I love doing shout outs to those who support this show and a shout out to C.S. Lewis uh, Company and Publicity for re recommending David as a guest. We just really appreciate that. All right, let's bring David White on. David, welcome to the Lisa Transformation. Thanks for having me. Good to see it, you. Finally. It's a, it's a pleasure. My goodness. Yeah, finally is right. Mm -hmm. Th those of you that are watching you probably don't, you know, you won't realize this, but we actually have been planning this interview for a very long time. And I think I read David's book last year. That's kind of the, the backlog that I have in terms of this show and getting <laughs> guests on. So thank you for the demand. Uh, it's amazing. Thank you for the fact that we have so many amazing people doing great things in the world that there can be that many people to interview, which is super cool. So let's dive in. Let's talk about this because David, one of the things that really interested me about your topic is the fact that you are going against the norm based on your study and experience about leaders driving corporate culture. So if it's not leaders that drive corporate culture, then who does? Great question. Uh, yes, I guess I am going against the norm, although I will say I've got about 125 years of anthropology behind me. So uh, I would say the science is on my side. But let me just uh, preface by saying um, I got interested in the study of corporate culture because I've been part of many, many culture transformations in large companies like Microsoft and IBM and, uh, and including even my own small startup. Uh, and none of them have worked. So I went back to graduate school at the uh, tender age of 48 and studied anthropology, which is actually the one discipline on the planet that really concerns itself primarily with culture. And I got into the uh, cognitive anthropology, which is the new science of culture or the relationship between the culture and the brain is sort of the new branch of anthropology in the last 30 years. And cognitive science has, is showing us, as you might imagine, a lot about the brain and how it works and including the social brain or what we call the cultural brain. And all that means is that cultures uh, are a lot more complex than we think they are in business especially, and that there's a big, big relationship between the body and the brain and our cultural and social environment. So in other words, put it simply, what we do all day long shapes how we think. So to answer to your question, is cultures form when any group of humans get together and do stuff? So cultures form just as well without leaders. You've been part of any group that doesn't have an obvious leader, over time, a culture or cultures will emerge. Uh, so this is the answer to your question. Now, uh, we can get into why leaders believe that they have to shape culture, and it's you know for very some very good reasons. And a lot of that tradition comes out of the 1970s when the world of management science changed, and we started thinking that you know people instead of being closely managed and coerced and and uh, being told what to do in organizations, people need to be sort of liberated and emancipated. This is the theory why uh, Doug McGregor's great, great work in the 1970s. And from that theory why uh, tradition and, uh, and body of work of McGregor's came an industry called the organizational or corporate culture industry. And it's really been a, uh, an invention, if, if you will, or a, uh, a, the work of management science scholars 
who have promulgated you know this idea of corporate culture and turned it into a billion dollar industry but the science of culture outside of business schools has been going on since you know the early 19 19 the early 20th century early 1900s with the work of margaret Re margaret mead and ruth benedict and the study of so-called primitive societies. So the you know the culture as a as a field of study has been around for a long time, and that's what I was trying to tap into. Got it. Long answer. Long answer to your good question. No, it is, and and it's a great great answer. And thank you. And let's define before we get into why leaders feel that they need to drive culture. Let's first define culture. How you define culture, so that we're all on the same page there. Yeah. So I want to just preface by saying. Um, I'm what, what I sort of see my role in the, in the book that you referenced as really a bridge between the world of, of uh, cognitive science and cognitive anthropology and the other related disciplines that are that are really interested in culture and the business world. And there's a big gap there because most of the books, you know, the thousands and thousands of books you'll see on Amazon on culture aren't really referencing or drawing from that body of literature. They're sort of um, stuck in what some of us call paradigm myopia. They're kind of, you know, talking in the echo chamber. And I'm trying to kind of change that by bringing the new science of culture, which is really an old science of culture, in, into the business conversation. So this is not the world according to David. This is really the, the, the prevailing modern cognitive science view on culture um, is that culture basically is knowledge. To answer your question, what we, uh, the, the word that I, the, the term that I liked, which is uh, referenced by a, a uh, David Cronenfeld, an anthropologist at, at UCLA, is that culture is a reference system. So what does that mean? Basically, that means that culture is an operating system. It kind of runs in the background, just like the operating system on your iPhone or your computer, runs in the background. You don't know you're using it, but you use it all day long in millions of ways to make sense and orient yourself to your world, your surrounding. And it, it's, we don't know we're using culture until it, it hits us in the face. Um, and you know, I use very simple analogies to, to make this point. For example, how do you know that you know, not to look at people in an elevator? How do you know that? Or how do you know when you get onto a subway, you know, those of us that ride subways, from, I'm from the East Coast, so um, that you don't block access to the subway car or the bus, right? How do you, you, don't, you, know, you don't get taught that in school. You might've been, you know, that might've been something you learned in your family but this is not a formal body of knowledge it's just stuff we know about how to function in the world i can tell Corporate you that my dad didn't work the same way. never learned that he would get into an <laughs> elevator and he would turn around and he would say to everybody you're probably all wondering why i called this meeting and people would be like what what did he just say that and he would laugh and he would have them all be his friends by the time he right got to the right. main floor. So anyway, just a little. <laughs> no, well, that's a, that's a great, that's a great anecdote, anecdote, Nicole, because this is another myth of culture is that cultures are not causal. Mm. Cultures Talk doesn't make us do anything. Culture doesn't make us do anything. It is, a, it's kind of a normative environment, um, or, or a reference system, an operating system, sort of behind the scenes that kind of delimits and constrains what we can do, but it doesn't cause us to do anything. So your dad wanting to kind of, he's upending or challenging the, the social system. And that gets us into the conversation about how do you change cultures? Because cultures are eligible to be changed. It's just a lot harder, but they don't cause us to do anything. Just, it's just, it's that when we go against the culture, it's very obvious. Mm. And that's, we become aware of our reference systems, our operating systems, our cultural, our cultural OS. We come, become aware of it when we, when we try to change something. You know, another analogy, silly analogy I use is like, it's like the water that the fish swim in. You know, you ask a fish to be aware or ask us to be aware of the air we breathe. Well, it's hard until, until you take that air away. Or like in California here, you know, suddenly smoke intrudes and suddenly we're suddenly very aware of that, you know, the, the air quality index is very bad. That's, that's like culture, we're becoming aware of our cultures when we actually, when they don't work for us or we try to change something. And that's, that's how cultures really interfere uh, mostly in, in, in the in the issue of transformation. Well, so that makes me think, you know, we look at culture and we look at some of the <clears throat> things that are happening right now in the world. There's a lot of, especially in the last few years, there's been a lot of talk about changing culture, you know, going to more diversity, equity, inclusion, yeah. whatever, just even changing, becoming a more humane 
culture. Is that where we start to do that? And maybe I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering if maybe we've been going about it the wrong way. And that's why we haven't seen the results that many want. Yeah. And I, absolutely. And I, I want to start by saying leaders, this is, you know, your, your podcast is a lot about leadership. Leaders absolutely have something to do with culture. It's just a lot more complex than we think it is. And it's not linear. It's not like cultures of, you know, input, output, input the culture you want and outcomes is magical. If it was that simple, you know, it wouldn't be a billion dollar industry and thousands of books. And we'd still be sort of arguing and talking about culture in 2021 when the concept's been around since the 1980s, right? Um, that's, that's how slow the science has been to sort of permeate the business community. Um, so yeah, leaders absolutely play a vital role in terms of intent, in terms of setting the agenda, setting the vision. The key to culture change, as I argue in the book, is practices. And that's a big word that I use a lot. Uh, practice is not just a fancy word for behavior. Uh, culture change is a lot more than, than just behavior. It, a practice is the um, routines, habits, processes, formal and informal, that your organization engages in all day long. So it's like how rituals. You run your business. Well, more than that, budgeting, planning, okay. your product practices, how you build product, how you go to market, how mm -hmm. you think about marketing, how you think about the customer. And they include HR stuff, of course. They even include social practices like how you onboard and how you do conflict and how you think about um, you know, who's a rock star or superstar in your organization, who's not, right? All of the, that sort of tribal knowledge kind of stuff, those are codified or embedded in practices. Uh, this is what a, a lot of the modern anthropology, cognitive anthropology is showing us is that culture gets codified in habits and routines of the collective. Now, leaders play a big role because leaders, of course, control resources, allocate, you know, set agendas, sanction rewards. Um, and that is what puts in place or dismantles practices. But until you go after the everyday ways in which you run your business, I'm talking about the very, very fundamental ways like how you monitor the business, you know, how do you keep tabs on performance, right? Until you go after those kinds of very deeply embedded practices, which are the carriers of your cultural DNA, uh, or your, your, what I call dominant logics, the tacit rules and beliefs that in, are embedded in these practices, and until you go after those kinds of things, you will not change your culture. So to, a long answer to your question is, yeah, you wanna make a, a, the workplace more humane Let's start thinking about humane practices. Let's not just put posters on a wall or start talking about our values. That might, that might matter, but it's very hard to change people's values. You can't really change, you know, I'm, I'm, you know Nicole, I'm gonna change your values or buy into my values if you wanna work at my company. That's essentially what corporate America does. It says, here are our values, you know, you wanna join us, buy in. Well, that's great. And it's, uh, it's a statement of intent for, for leadership teams, but Unless the, the employee population is already bought into those values, it's very hard to actually change people's values. So, so it's good for people that you're hiring, but not necessarily great for those that are already there. They kind of either agree or they don't agree is what I'm hearing you say. And it winds up being lip service and it winds up often breeding a lot of cynicism. You know, for example, every, every company on the planet talks about teamwork. At least every company I know I've ever been a part of or consulted to talks yeah. about teamwork. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, what is, I, you know, what is teamwork, right? It manifests differently in terms of behaviors, but also it's sometimes, um, and in the, in the culture model that I put forth in the book, I talk about how teamwork can sometimes, or value like teamwork can actually be sometimes an adaptation or a reaction to something else that's going on in the culture that's actually deep, more deep seated and more pervasive. So for example, we have a client here in the San Francisco Bay Area who talks a lot about collaboration and teamwork, but underneath that is a very strong sort of tacit belief in knowing your stuff. They call it craft. Like, and the people who are really uh, valued in the organization and who people wanna work with are people who are at the top of their game and, and know their craft, engineers, data scientists, um, operations people, really just sort of people who are very um, crafty uh, in, in their language, in the company's language. And so, and the team, and the company's notoriously bad at teaming because unless you know your stuff, nobody is going to work with you. Um, so 
teamwork becomes a value that the leadership team, the management team of the company espouses. We all want to you know, collaborate and be and team better as a compensation for or an antidote to this more prevailing cultural belief, tacit belief or background belief around craft. So you see that you see now I mean, this is a very simple example and for this is a relatively small company here in the Bay Area, but you can see that how complex cultures are right because some things that we interpret culture to be like these prevailing attitudes or the espoused values of the leadership team are actually compensations for or reactions to something more deep seated deep seated in the social system, which is what culture is and what i'm what I'm interested in is what's the lived culture what's that deep seated DNA stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm thinking about those that are listening. I'm trying to make it practical for them who you know are listeners and for myself. Absolutely. I'm interested in this for sure. That's why we're here. That's why we're having this conversation. So I'm thinking about, and it's kind of funny because on this show, I've had, I've had a lot of leadership consultants and I've had, that's just a f- small fraction of the leadership consultants who have submitted applications to be on this show. And one of the things that has kind of been, so I, don't, I don't know if it's like a pet peeve or whatever, but sometimes I'm kind of the devil's advocate that way. And, and I'm, I'm like, if we've got all these leadership consultants out there, why do we have so many dysfunctional companies, right? And if we're doing so much and you look at the conference business and you look at the training and yeah. development business and you, you realize how much is actually being spent on training and development and team mm-hmm. retreats and all of that. And you wonder like, if that's the case, why are so many businesses, so many organizations dysfunctional, right? Yeah. And unhealthy and having unhealthy cultures. Why do 80% of people, give or take, that that statistic is is uh, more, I think it used to be 65%, now they say 80 to 85% hate their jobs. Why is that the case? And so if I think about like, okay, let's say I have an organization, I want to improve the culture. Where do I begin in this process? You alluded to it a little bit. I want to get into some steps like, what do they actually do? Obviously, I would say go get a copy of your book because you talk about a lot of that in the book and you give examples. But for today, it's like, what do they do to get started on this journey? Because it's like they got to turn... I mean, they might have to turn yeah. the ship into an entirely different direction. Yeah. And you can't just fire everybody, although companies have done that, no. fire them and rehire <laughs> them back. You know, it's, it's, uh, there's, that's easier when you're a little smaller, but when you're big, you can't do that. Yep. Yep. No, and disruptive. Let's, that's let's, very disruptive. Let's assume your question pertains to an existing company, you know, a, a large, fairly complex organization, not a startup, because it's infinitely easier in a startup. Yes. And and it the sort of the, the stuff I'm talking about um, doesn't really apply until companies get to a certain size. And that okay. can be anywhere from like 150 to 200 people. Then then these cultures that I'm talking about, the, the DNA, uh, the dominant logic start to really inter- interfere. When you have a small company, you can do a lot of the, you know, you can sort of set culture in a, in a more deliberate way. The answer to your question, though, is practically speaking, first and foremost, is is start to develop awareness. And as a leader, we can't have enough self-awareness and organization, organizational or institutional awareness. And that really start means start noticing. Start noticing the habits and routines of the, of the organization, of the collective. Start, start noticing how you are running your business. For example, uh, we spend a lot of time working with industrial manufacturing companies. Um, one of our, several of our clients spend, you know, 20 to 30 hours a month in management meetings, simply monitoring the performance of the business. These are whole management teams spending, you know, 20 to 30 hours a month just reviewing the business performance, right? That's a lot of time when you factor in the amount of time, you know, the compensation and the fully loaded salaries of executives spending 20 to 30 hours a month, just simply monitoring business performance. Why are they doing that? Well, it's doing that yes. because like there's yeah, however each, many yeah. there's, <laughs> you think about yeah multiply it out like 10 yeah. you know, 10 people on a leadership team 30 hours a month right do the math so why are they doing that well that is that is a manifestation in my in my book in my in my argument it's a manifestation of a of a risk 
uh, orientation or a certain what I call a certainty culture or certainty logic that drives the part of that culture, which is really about managing and foreseeing all risks, right? Why? Well, because in industrial manufacturing companies, the cost of failure is very, very high. As the old saying goes, you can't, you don't ship beta version versions of dishwashers or refrigerators. Right. But in the software world, as you know, and we know in the Bay Area, you know, software companies routinely ship, in fact, as a matter of course, ship products with known bugs, with known defects. Why? Because mm -hmm. in two weeks, there'll be another release. You'll get another download of, you know, I, I run the Android operating system and every two weeks there's a new release. And so whatever was buggy in that previous release gets fixed, right? It's a very different orientation to risk. So all this to say the practices associated with the culture that you want to change need to be examined. Start by noticing what are the logics or what are the beliefs inherent in the way you do business? Start questioning those. And if you want to, for example, be more collaborative, or be more agile or make decisions faster, start dismantling the practices that keep you uh, in, you know, the, the sclerosis that keeps you in management meetings for 30 or 40 hours a month and start questioning, why are we doing this? Can we do it faster? Can we do it better? Until you start going after the habits of the organization, the routines of the organization, until you start sort of looking at those with a pretty fine, you know, in a fine grained way, you will continue to perpetuate the culture that you have. I also want to preface that that's incredibly difficult for most leaders to do that. It's incredibly difficult. This is why it's much easier for consulting firms and leaders to focus on behaviors and values and, and speeches. And, you know, we just need to change the behavior of the organization. Let's, you know, because that, that it's a lot easier to sell consulting gigs and it's a lot easier to think of culture as behavior or values than it is to think about these habits and routines that we do all day long that are embedded in, in how we do business. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. Well, and, and I believe that, <clears throat> you know, I, I teach this model, it's called the results model. And, and, you know, you think about results <clears throat> or outcomes, um, you know, what, what creates those results and outcomes are the behaviors, the habits, the actions, but <clears throat> what, what influences that is mindset, which is influenced by beliefs, which is what you're talking about is actually challenging your beliefs. And so if we want to create results that are different, yeah. better or whatever, then we need to start looking at the roots because the roots determine the fruits. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Exactly. And, and uh, you know, it's not unlike an individual if we say, you know, well, you know, I want to quit smoking or I want to lose 20 pounds or I want to, you know, start improving, you know, eat more healthily, what is the first thing you need to do? You can't just sort of will yourself to those outcomes. You can, yeah. you can try, but typically, you know, it's the diet, what we call the dieters model of change, right? You, you lose 10 pounds in the first month, but you wind up gaining those 10 pounds plus 10 more pounds in the second month right. because willpower can only take you so far until you actually start changing the daily routines. What time you wake up in the morning, whether you have a smoothie or, pancakes for breakfast, you know, until you start changing those kinds of habits and routines, you will not make changes to your lifestyle that you intend. It's the same with organizations. And the simplest way of saying it is that culture is in the brain. Culture is a neurochemical process. It just happens to be a neurochemical process at the level of the collective, at the level of the organization. And if you want to change brain chemistry as a CEO, you need to change the routines and practices and habits of the organization, which mostly are codified in your organizational processes, in your in your big time planning, budgeting, customer, product, HR processes. Got That's it. hard. That's very hard. Yeah. If I go to a CEO and say, hey, you need to change the way you do strategy. You need to change the way you allocate resources. You need to change the way you do budgets. You need you need to think hard about, you know, um, how you how you go to market. Yeah. And that's how that's how we change because it's a very indirect way. We're changing the brain chemistry yeah. by changing the routines. You know, we don't I don't anthropologists don't think of cultures like a black box. It's not like you don't change the culture, you change the habits that make up the culture. Right. That's how you get that's how you get at brain chemistry. Well, and that and that makes sense. That makes sense when you think about it, because you can tell somebody all day long, do this, 
But if right. you're doing something different, it's like, do what I say and not what I do. That's not going to, exactly. that's not going to work. So yeah. I want to, uh, I want to jump to some comments that we have here and I'm going to put this up on the screen. There's a couple of them here from Charles <laughs> Mathis. So the first one is, uh, let me see here. He says, is the dysfunction a result of the mismatch between the stated goal of improved corporate culture and the underlying culture of hierarchy win, lose power over? And I'm also going to show the second one because you can maybe tag dovetail these is why is it so hard for leaders to do that self-reflection? Charles, thank you for being here. Thank you for your questions. Excellent questions. David? Great questions. Um, I'll take the first one first because that's a little bit more straightforward. Um, in my estimation, in my experience, I should say, uh, I don't think this is universally true, but I think it's it's largely true. Uh, leaders are mostly well intended. I actually believe people pretty much want to do the right thing, and leaders, CEOs, chief exec, senior executives have mostly good intent, um, but in my experience, one of the things that gets in the way is <clears throat> two things, actually. One is sort of a narcissistic blind spot, and the other is sort of a guilt blind spot. If I start approaching, if I go to you, Nicole, and I, as a CEO and say, you know, your, your, your company's in serious trouble because of your culture, and the way we want to change your culture is actually change pretty much the way you run your business day to day. First thing that might come to mind for you would be, well, gee, you know, I've, as, this lead, as the CEO or as the leadership team, we put in place these practices to begin with, and now you're telling us that we need to change. That's, that's very hard because you feel culpable. There's a sense of culpability and guilt and or a sort of narcissistic investment in, well, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard it worked at my last company, and this is the way we've always done it. And so therefore, this is the way we're going to do it. Or this is how you run a manufacturing business, or this is how you run a, you know, a, a airline or a cosmetics business. And we're not going to do it differently because it's worked, you know, time my time industry again. is different. You don't understand the industry. Yeah, you don't understand. Yeah, exactly. So th I think that those are two reasons why that self-reflection is difficult because um, leaders feel responsible. And it's very hard to, to kind of hold up the mirror. There's an awful lot of truth telling that's required in, in, uh, in culture change. I say to my clients, if you want to start, if you want to start on the culture change journey, start learning how to have really hard conversations internally. Like, and many, many of our clients have trouble just doing that, which is a manifestation of a, of a risk. What's an example uh, of, a, of a difficult conversation that they need to have that they maybe are afraid to have? Just using the examples I've already used, you know, for example, why are we spending 30 hours in management meetings every month? What value are they adding? Yeah. Why are, why are we, uh, a very classic example, might it be possible to stop thinking about running the business in a quarter to quarter fashion? Could we miss a quarter of, of revenue, of, of, of financial results? Could we miss a quarter because we have to make longer term investments in order to to drive the, the change agenda we want or drive the culture change we want. Now you can start to see this becomes pretty um, a pretty difficult conversation. Why, you know, if we miss the quarter, we, we risk losing the investors. We risk, you know, activist shareholders coming in. I mean, there's many, many good reasons why a quarter to quarter short term focus is highly justified for a lot of companies. But that quarter to quarter focus may keep your culture mired through through practices in a short-term mentality when um, taking big risks or being creative or um, upending conventional ways of doing things might be what's required, especially for legacy companies involved in this huge fourth industrial revolution uh, involving digital transformation. Many companies struggle mightily with digital transformation, legacy companies, for these reasons. Yeah. So, it's kind of a long-winded answer, but that's, you know, that's part, and that comes in part from Charles's question of this idea of, if we could be more self-reflective and understand that um, these logics by which, that which anchor our culture, uh, these dominant logics would keep our culture in place, are there because cultures are essentially adaptive systems. They're ad adaptations to current environments, but if that environment needs to change, or if the, if the environment is driving change, then 
the culture needs to change and the practices that anchor the culture need to change. Well, and you, you mentioned about um, earlier, you talked about risk. And so there is a there is a safety in the comfort of this is the way it's always been done. And so at least yeah. we know it's like, you know, the, we know this enemy, right? We, or we know this result, but yeah. do we know that if we change it, and this is like one of the biggest things for people when they say they don't like change is, is because it's uncertain. Like what would happen if we actually change the way we did things? What if it doesn't work and there's that fear of failure that comes in. And of course, then you can dive into as a coach, you know, I, I dive into like, okay, well, what's the belief that's driving that? What's the fear that's driving that the fear of failure? What does that mean yeah. to, you know, to, and, and the crazy thing is, is that when you look at successful companies, they are used to the fact of recognizing that you fail forward. So if you never try, you, you never know whether or not you could actually do it far better. Challenging right. a, a small startup and saying, okay, well, it, I think of one of my clients years ago, you know, their delivery time was two weeks and they just know, I think it was mm -hmm. like a, it was embroidery or something, but I remember the, 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 the conversation talking about like, it was two weeks to get the product to the customer. And I said, well, what if, what if you were to offer like a 24 hour service, a right. 48 hour right. service, what would that mean in the marketplace in terms of, um, you know, your positioning, your unique value proposition when people want things yesterday. And it can be done because there are companies that do it. And yeah. so they're like, well, it's impossible. I mean, that's just not how we do it here, you know? And so, but I said, okay, so, but what if? And if you start opening your mind to the what if, what's possible, and yeah. rather than looking at, and it comes back to this idea of, are we focusing on loss and mitigating our loss? Or are we focusing on the potential growth and opportunity that's there. If we focus on playing not to lose, then we won't make that change. But if we're looking at playing to win, we might take some extra risks, calculated risks, intelligent risks, hiring people that know what they're doing, that have done it elsewhere, that have it's, they've got the proven results. But we're going to take those calculated risks, give it a shot and test it, right? Test and measure it and see what happens from there. Yeah. And it's a great example. And yet, you know, um, I can't tell you how many executives will say to you or to me the exact same things that you said, if we just, you know, ask what if and start asking these questions, but a lot of, especially in complex, you know, large complex organizations, a lot of, a lot of senior executives believe that you can do it. You can have it both ways. In other words, we can, let's take digital transformation again. We spend a lot of time in helping companies trying to become more digitally savvy and turn into platforms. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of executives believes, believe that we can do, we can have it all. In other words, we can run the business where we have run it for 25 years and we can be agile and fast and take risks and, you know, do, do what sort of digital companies do. But words are cheap. Right. Yeah. And and until again, I, I sound like a broken record, but until until you actually are willing to change the practices by which you run your business, no yeah. amount of saying, you know, well, um, make the numbers for the quarter. Oh, and by the way, you know, completely disrupt your 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 uh, your customer value chain while you're at it. Right. Um, which is actually it sounds crazy if, if we just talk about it here and sort of in the, in the abstract. But in many companies, that's that's actually the marching orders for a lot of a lot of teams. You know, make mm -hmm. those numbers. Oh, but by the way, you know, fundamentally change the way you go to market because now we're selling solutions and not products. Right? Do it. Do it all. And the the point is, you can't do it all. And at, so, at the core of your question of your anecdote, and at the core of culture change, you know whether you're taking a cognitive anthropo anthropological view like I am or, or not, is learning, right? Because at, the, at this core is, is, is the question that I always ask organizations and chief executives, is how willing are you to learn? How, how much, you know, back to Senge and learning organizations, how much of a learning organization mindset do you have? And are you willing to actually see the world potentially through different lenses and, and what that entails? which doesn't just mean 
you know, make the numbers and disrupt your entire value chain. It means make a choice. Are we going to make the numbers or are we going to actually disrupt? Because you can't do both. And that's, you know, we live in this kind of idea that's, that somehow we can have it all as I'm talking about we as, you know, people who run large companies or consult to large companies. And it's incredibly difficult to do that because, again, the practices that you have in place, which are manifestations of dominant logics, these tacit knowledge, knowledge, uh, the tacit knowledge that runs as the anchor points of our culture, those keep you doing things the way you've always done them yeah. and preclude change. Yeah. I've got another comment that I want to share here. And it is from Kamal El Rassi. Actually, I've I met Kamal years ago. So uh, glad you're here, Kamal. Thank you. Habits and routines that be, can be changed by studying mindset material. Leaders and managers have to change on the inside. Mindset, subconscious level. Do you agree? And then he also goes on to say, it is a mindset. Subconscious level is running on automatic and not just a process change. Thoughts on that, David? Yeah, I would fully, completely agree. And Kamal is, com is completely onto it. I would say that the first, so in, in, in the book, I, I spelled this out. The first step to culture change is awareness. And what are you aware of? Aware of the dominant logics that are behind the way you run your business, which usually are a shared mindset or shared dominant logics that you share as a collective. Usually it's a leadership team, but it's usually widely widespread in the organization. What are the dominant logics that anchor your business, the dominant belief systems and assumptions that you've made about the world. And those are, that's an internal process, absolutely. But it's difficult, right? Because this is this is background, this is tacit, this is pre-conscious, pre-verbal. So usually it requires some intervention by some outsider to surface. You know, if I ask you, Nicole, what, do you, what, do you, what, are, what assumptions do you have about the world or about your business? Well, you know, you, you and I might be here for three or four hours trying to figure that out, right? So it has to be triggered and there's a, you know, sort of a structured process by which you do that. Once you surface, however, those, what I call the dominant logics, the shared dominant logics that anchor your business, which is a pre-conscious, it's, it's an exercise in making the pre-conscious conscious. I use the word pre-conscious, by the way. It's not unconscious. You know it. You just don't know you know it. It's the same way that you know not to look at people in the elevator in the eye. You know that, but don't know you know it until I bring it to your attention. So that pre-conscious stuff is brought to the surface, to Kamal's point, best done as, at a collective, at a, at a leadership, at a, at a group level, like usually a leadership team, at the interventions made at the leadership team level. Then you start to see how those assumptions and beliefs that, that were pre-conscious manifest across the organization. How do my assumptions about risk show up in practice? How do my assumptions about the customer show up in practice? How do my assumptions about, um, you know, seeing is believing or local knowledge because I, you know, I have a bunch of assumptions that unless, unless you give me a concrete example, I won't believe you. I mean, these are, these are kind of dominant mindsets in, in many organizations. How does that show up? And so we, we create kind of an architecture or a map kind of a cognitive map of how your belief systems manifest in practice across the six major practice areas of, areas of your business from planning all the way through to uh, people and everything in between. So yeah. that's, so, so Kamal's point is a question is a great one because that's, that's exactly the process. It starts from the inside and works to the outside. And you use the word at the beginning, it's, it's changed from the inside out. Absolutely, because culture is a shared mind a shared pre-conscious mind and it has to come from internal awareness. Yeah. I've got some great comments here. So we have yeah. Tevis. Tevis was also on this show previously. She's amazing. So mm -hmm. I encourage you to go to little, little plug for her, go to leaders transformation.com, our website. Mm -hmm. And if you type in Tevis, her uh, interview will come up. She says that I love that social scientists converge on what the yogis and wise ones have said for millennia and what the org nerds like you and I have been advising for years. So Rodney yeah. uh, W.J. Collins, PhD, curious uh, what you think of this conversation. So uh, she's, she's doing a shout out to someone. Here's another one. Brian yeah. Brogan. Uh, he's amazing as well. I was just actually on his podcast recently, Build for Success. Yeah. And uh, it, he says, reminds me of the cartoon of a speaker asking, who wants change? Everyone raises their hands. 
Then the speaker asks, who wants to change? No one raised their hand. The model of change you expect uh, and model the change you expect in others. That is so, so true. Thank you all for, for joining us here and uh, tuning in. This is, this is great. I love the, the dialogue. Um, we, we had, uh, we had Antos use, add one more word to that sentence. Who wants to be changed? Raise your hands. Yes. Usually no one, usually no one does. <laughs> yeah. The, like the, I, I will change, but I'll do it on my terms. You don't tell me. That's to, right. To change. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. This is so good, David. Thank you. There is so much that we can, we can dive into further. I'm going to encourage our uh, listeners and viewers to go to your website, ontosglobal.com, get a copy of your book because you unpack this in detail, Disrupting Corporate Culture. So go get a copy of David's book. Um, you're also, I'm going to put a shout out for you're also on LinkedIn so they can search you, David G. White. And uh, of course, they can find you on Twitter. Anything else you want to share before we wrap up today? Uh, well, thank you for having me first, Nicole. It's been great and uh, and great to be part of a live live stream conversation with the text. It's really cool. Um, and I want to just, you know, I, I would say, you know, the only other thing that we haven't really talked about, but is so essential for leaders and coaches of leaders like us, um, and it's maybe obvious, but Culture change requires, first and foremost, a lot of humility, and yes. something something we don't also see a lot of in the uh, corporate world, and certainly at the in the C suite, a lot of humility about the complexities, the difficulties of the endeavor. Yes. And yet, at the end of the day, it's all about making workplaces where we spend most of our lives more humane. That's kind of what what all this is about at the end of the day. That is so true. I think one of the greatest leadership qualities, you know, we can talk about vision, we can talk about integrity, we can talk about empathy, you know, lots of different things yeah. that we can talk about, but humility is definitely, definitely one that, uh, that I subscribe to uh, work on. It's funny mm -hmm. though, when you say I'm humble, it's probably means that you're not. So, <laughs> but, it's, but we, we work on it and we, we challenge yeah. it. So, um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you to our, yeah. our viewers and our listeners. And thank you for the great dialogue here. This has been fantastic. And if you are watching this uh, or listening later, please continue to chat and comment with us. And we want to continue to dialogue with you. We appreciate you being here and, uh, and share it with a friend. If you have somebody that you know that is, or, you know, running a company that is just, you know, stuck and they don't know how to make the changes without actually, of course, maybe they don't want to be the change first, but you know, there's all of that <laughs> going on that we just talked about, but that they're looking for some change, you know, to share it with them and uh, get them involved in this conversation. I think these conversations are very, very valuable. Go get a copy of David's book. And once again, a plug for his book, Disrupting Corporate Culture. Also, Next time, next week, we're going to have another amazing guest interview. And uh, I won't mention who it is because I mentioned last week about this guest that we were going to have this week and they rescheduled. But the great news <laughs> is we got David on and we had such an amazing conversation. So, but I promise you, whoever it is that's going to be next week on Tuesday will be amazing. So come and join us, get involved in the conversation. We're here to disrupt for good. We're here to make a greater impact in the world, we're, make the world a better place for everyone. And that is what we're here at Leaders of Transformation about. So uh, we appreciate you again. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon.